All right. Well, welcome, Rachel. I'm super excited to talk about the deep dive of trauma. (laughs) This is one of my favorite topics in the whole world. And actually, I didn't think about this until this moment, but in the fall, I did um, the Center for Mind Body Medicine is here in DC. And I did the training and the founder of it, Dr. James Gordon or Jim Gordon has been doing trauma healing work. He was a doctor at Georgetown and Mm -hmm. then started with mind body practices. And he has a book coming out in the fall about trauma. So I want to connect you guys also um, because I think it will be a good connection given the work that you do. So tell us about what you do and how you got into it. Sure. Um, I will just say before I do that, I I love that you said like the deep, dark world of trauma and something I like to sometimes say at the beginning of an interview is just that you can take this content in slowly. You can press pause. You can stop. Sometimes when we're listening to things that have to do with the body, our body is also listening. And so cognitively we think we're fine. We're like, I'm a smart person. I can just listen to this, whatever. It's just information. And then all of a sudden we're like, whoa, I'm super taken out. So Mm -hmm. There's no like full permission to press pause. And that doesn't mean that we're going to go places that are horrific or anything. Totally. Like Who knows? But, <laughs> well, I, I try to, you know, I try not to actually. So, yeah. Um, I am a trauma resolution educator, coach, and guide. I work mostly with women who have either sexual or developmental trauma or complex trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, Complex trauma Mm -hmm. is trauma from a situation, perhaps emotional, that you couldn't get out of. So maybe because you were young or maybe because Mm -hmm. there was some kind of financial stronghold or maybe because you needed the person that was also not treating you great. That's complex trauma. Developmental trauma happens at a developmental young age, usually before you're 12 or so. Mm -hmm. And sexual trauma is anything that is a sexual violation, including harassment. So I work with people who've had those kinds of experiences Mm -hmm. and I help them reclaim their sense of worthiness, Mm -hmm. sense of sovereignty and healthy boundaries, sense of safety, expressing the fullness of who they are, right? Their sensual, sexual, mystical, spiritual, sensitive self-expression, trusting themselves, trusting their truth, trusting their clarity and their leadership. Um, among a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. So that's the gist of what I do. I wrote a book called Secret Bad Girl, which was a sexual trauma memoir. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on another book called Rebloom. Pathways, uh, well, what is normal? What's my subtitle for this? Subtitle still to be determined, but (laughs) along the lines of post-traumatic growth in sex, love, and society. Is it a second to Secret Bad Girl or is it sort of different or just evolved or how would it's you say what was the purpose? method and modality mm-hmm. for working with trauma that's okay. soulful feminine um there's a whole metaphor and allegory about mm-hmm. a garden and mm-hmm. the different parts like the flowers and mm-hmm. there's seven different archetypes that get revived so it's a whole method okay <laughs> yeah. um why would someone So one of the things that I hear a lot is, or someone will sort of say like, why should I deal with this? What's the purpose of um, doing the resolution and educating myself on, on the trauma, on the experiences? Like, why do you think people should do this work? I love that question. And I love whoever's asking it, because if you're asking like, why should I do this? it might not actually be the right thing for you to do Mm -hmm. yet Mm -hmm. or right now or Mm -hmm. whatever. Um, If your instinct or your impulse is telling you, why would I go into that really deep, dark, scary stuff? Mm -hmm. It's probably not the right timing for you. (laughs) Usually when it is the right timing, we have this sense of like, crap, I have to deal with this. Yeah. Yeah. Time for me to look at this. And you know why? The reason why is because the same problem has been happening over and over again. You don't want it to happen anymore. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you're ill Mm -hmm. in a way that connects to the emotional experiences or physical experiences you've had in the past. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the reasons why people end up coming. They're like Mm -hmm. dissatisfied 
in dynamics that are repetitive. Mm -hmm. So they see that pattern and they're like, okay, now it's time to think, to think about changing it or to think about why it's happening. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the, one of the reasons I ask that question and hear it is because trauma has become, at least in the, especially in the yoga community, has become um, a very hot word, tra trauma-informed <laughs> yoga, trauma-informed, and in classrooms. So I also work in schools and with kids and teachers, and it's in the classrooms. Like, it's now the new trigger. You know, there's lots of, like, these buzzwords that come up, and then we get really into it. And in some ways, I'm so glad, because at least we're talking about it, and it's, it's coming out. Um, and at the same time, I think it, it's kind of like how mindfulness was a few years ago. Everyone is trying to be mindful and reading about mindfulness and really beating themselves up about it. And mm -hmm. so that's why I ask about it. And I love that answer that it's not always like the right time if it doesn't feel good <laughs> to do it, you know? Yeah. But then on the other side, why is this such a hot button? Totally. Thing? Well, for a long time, we've been approaching our healing from the head up. Mm -hmm. We're intellectualizing, yes. even the way we consider or think about emotions is still mm -hmm. sort of in our heads. Like, well, how am I feeling about this? Mm -hmm. Where when we're doing trauma resolution work, we're dealing primarily with the nervous system, mm -hmm. theology, mm -hmm. and also the soul, mm -hmm. which are things that you feel under the surface, below the shoulders, in mm -hmm. your body, in your sensations, in your, in your intuition, in your hunches. So if you're only ever approaching your healing from a cognitive behavioral method, that's wonderful. There's a lot there. Like I'm not going to in any way throw that out. And there are the deepest layers of the way we're wired happen in the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's, we're talking about it in schools is because basically we have an embodied response to threat. Mm -hmm. It's called your neuroception. You can mm -hmm. go into hypersocialization, which is overpleasing or trying to make everyone else feel okay, or you know, adjusting yourself if you're around someone who's not so safe. You can go into fight or flight, mm -hmm. right? attacking or fleeing a perceived danger or violation, or you can go into freeze, which has different levels of dissociation or checking out. You could also flock, like band together with other people and leave, like the caravan. Or you could fornicate, have a ton of sex to try to preserve your species. So these are all the ways that we naturally respond to threat. Well, when you're a child and you're doing that because you're in unsafe situations, mm -hmm. which, you know, which happens a lot of times like in communities that have been systemically oppressed, this is why trauma-informed this or that is being brought into schools, especially in disadvantaged neighborhoods, because you've got a whole bunch of kids who are embodying trauma responses. And if you just tell them to behave differently, it's not gonna work. Mm -hmm. What you actually have to do is allow them to complete those responses in a safe space so that they can re-regulate their system and now they have access to their reasonal, reasoning rational mind. Yeah. So that's a big reason why we do trauma work because when our bodies are hijacked, we can't think, we can't be creative, or let me say, we're less, yeah. Yeah. We're less creative, we're less relationally wise. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I know you, we don't know each other. Like we're not, we're not friends, you know, yeah. um, we're friendly now, but we're not friends. And so you don't know that I, what, I don't think you know that I was a teacher in DC public schools for five years. Mm. And in Southeast. And so one of the things that I say, and I was young, I was in I my 20s. In DC schools too. You did? Yeah. Where did you I work? In, I was in Anacostia. I Where? Was in, at the high school? At Blue or at Anacostia? No, I was working with um, Sasha Bruce Youth Work. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. So I was going in and out of a whole bunch of different schools. Yeah, yeah. I can't even remember all the names. This is like a decade. Yeah. Ago. And you're younger than I am. Yeah. So yeah. I, we wouldn't have crossed paths, but I taught at Randall Highlands and at Emory. Randall's right over in Southeast and then a charter school for boys. But the stuff, that, the, the piece is that if I had known then what I know now about our system, our brain, I mean, you know, I think in some ways, even then yoga and mindfulness had 
really penetrated and started, I'd started classes and I'd started to have my own practice. And like most people, when you start, you share it with everybody. Right. I'm like, this is so good. So I would do some stuff with the kids, but didn't know all of the stuff that we know now. Yeah. And I just think about the teacher, we have a lot of teachers in our community. And I think about the teachers learning this and implementing it in the classroom. And I'm curious for you, one of the things I want to ask you is Mr. Dr. Gordon in the fall, he said, we were doing some shaking and dancing before mm -hmm. our sessions. Um, and one of the things he said was he uses shaking and dancing with everyone that he works with, whether it's administrators or doctors or patients mm -hmm. or healers. He said, because of the research on shaking and trauma was so profound that he is, you know, there's this whole idea now that everyone's walking around with some level of PTSD or something, again, kind of extreme. And yeah. so we could use a lot of these strategies for any groups that we're in. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's absolutely true. I mean, we yeah. live in a culture. So one of the things with Rebloom is I have seven core wounds. Okay. And the seventh wound is colonization. And we're all in a colonized state, you know, we're all in a colonized world. And what that means is the other previous six wounds, neglect, exploitation, shame and repression, manipulation and control, violence and isolation and alienation are used mm -hmm. um, significantly by a select few to control everything and everyone so that they can profit. And of course, you know, those people are probably somewhat sociopathic, so we can have some compassion for them, but they also shouldn't be running the world. Um, yeah. okay. So all of that to say, we're in systems that cut us off from our wild instincts and impulses. Yeah. Most people in today's day and age don't have community secure attachment, like secure community attachment. Yeah. We talk about secure attachment to one person, but our nature as humans is to be in villages, is to be in communities. Mm -hmm. Most people don't have secure community attachment, let alone secure attachment with a partner and a few close friends. Most people are raising their children all by themselves. Mm -hmm. Most people have all of the financial pressure for their entire lives on hinging on one or two people. There's not enough sharing. <laughs> like our culture doesn't share. Our culture doesn't we don't take care of each other. Mm -hmm. And that's just like the simple baseline. Then we can add in things like the prison industrial complex yeah. or the fact that our food is poisoned or yeah. all of this. I'm not going to go down the line yeah. of all the things that are horrible. But <laughs> we're all actually fending off so much more violation than we realize. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And to attempt to be a healthy person mm -hmm. requires an an enormous amount of devotion, an enormous amount of practice. And one of those practices could absolutely be shaking, dancing, mm -hmm. rewilding your nature, reconnecting to your physiology of aliveness. That's a really powerful, important thing to do. Mm -hmm. And hard, because there's a momentum of, there's a momentum of dissociation that we're all sort of under that we can't even really see. Mm -hmm. At so many levels. And even in where we live, you're, where do you live now? I'm in San Diego. Yeah. So even, even that, the energy, the spaciousness, the connection to nature, that's so profoundly healing for the human spirit, yeah. um, depending on where you live and what you have access to. Um, again, just those deep lit levels and layers of um, what we're really sort of going through every day in so many different ways, you know, and even living, you know, so I have two kids and a husband. So I live in a, a, a fine size for us, for our family home, but it is also uh, energetically living with three other people and three animals. There's a lot in here <laughs> every day. And um, I, really value and prioritize these kind of conversations and um, talking about soul and spirit and creativity. Um, but I would not say that my husband or my children really have that privilege all day, every day. And so they come home with a lot of everybody else's also. So I just like to say, especially for the, the women who live in homes with a lot of people, that it does impact you and it does make a difference and how our family comes home and what those relationships are like really affect you also. I mean, but th these are things that people don't talk about, right? Because 
at sort of a day-to-day -day level. How are you? Fine. How are you? Fine. You know, see you at soccer or meet you at Whole Foods. Like it's very um, transactional or yeah, teamwork -y, but And not. so when you go deeper to say like, yeah, I'm really feeling this because, you know, my husband might de be depressed or my kid yesterday at my kid's school, there was a swastika and mm -hmm. then, and we're Jewish. And so both my kids had questions about that, at which point we got into my daughter in her class, they were talking about um, the talk that African-American parents have to give African-American sons around police. And yeah. so there was these layers and, and then there was sort of in our car, just quiet. Right. I think we just sort of like sat there and held space together and sort of did some breathing together and came home and did some more conversation and journaling. But the point of all this is that it takes time and presence and awareness and that yeah. devotion is what I sort of circled over and over in my notes that, yeah, it is a commitment and a devotion to each other, really. Right. I love that you said that about the devotion piece. <clears throat> I mean, everything you said is just beautiful just there. But one of the things I've been talking about, and I think this will be relevant to your people, is this idea of boundaries mm -hmm. and what creates healthy boundaries. Mm -hmm. So often we try to keep bad things out as our mode of boundaries. Mm -hmm. But life happens. Like there are things all around us mm -hmm. that are always going to be trying to get in. Mm -hmm. right? There's swastikas on the wall of the mm -hmm. school. Well, yeah. Or, you know, <laughs> racism. Like these things don't go away. You can't keep them out. Um, and so one of the things I really love to anchor into around boundaries is that it's actually about devotion to thriving. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. physical and emotional practices, commitments, um, yep. do I need to have yep. that help me thrive? How can I be more devoted to my and my family and our world's thriving? And that's like, the strongest boundary we can have. Mm -hmm. the so interesting. Oh, totally. And I think I was yesterday, no, maybe it was this morning, I was in Rock Creek with a friend and um, we were talking about, I said to her, it's so interesting because all of the women I know who have the clearest boundaries mm -hmm. and who I really respect and love about them, none of them have children. And this is something... They sort of started to connect the dots. And so I asked her, you know, we just started talking about it. She's also in her mid forties and she has one child, but I just said, I wonder if, you know, I've learned so much from my friends who don't have children and how they look at boundaries in their life and their own commitments and devotions and practices and rituals as so sacred. And I feel like we're sort of moving in, in such a good way having these conversations and we're learning so much from the women who don't have children about how to embody that more and mm. more because that language of self-care as selfish is really dissolving. Yeah. Um, it, w it was very prevalent for a long time, at least in our community. I would hear that a lot. Well, if I go to yoga for me, then it's, it's selfish. Um, so I guess what I want to, ask you about a little bit is what are, what is your devotion to thriving look like? What are your boundaries? Uh, what does that look like in your life? Yeah. So for me, I know that I thrive the most when I have a certain period of time to connect, to, to connect in nature and to connect to prayer. Mm -hmm. So prayer is like my greatest devotion. I know for me, and prayer, meditation, contemplation. Just yeah, like, what is prayer for you? For me, it's, it's literally being like, great beloved, enter into my heart and guide me. Like mm -hmm. I'm fully mm -hmm. devoted to your love being the guiding force of my life. Mm -hmm. But taking, even if it's just 10 or 15 minutes to anchor in to that sacred energy is one of the things that I know keeps me aligned. Mm -hmm. Another piece is I have this coherence practice through Rebloom where each of these um, core wounds, they have a core blueprint. They have a natural blueprint. So from neglect, it's worthiness. Mm -hmm. And then each blueprint has an archetype. So the, the archetype of worthiness is the soul seed. 
et cetera, et cetera. There's a gatekeeper, an expressionista, whatever. Mm. And there's a coherence practice where I connect to a place in my body and there's a small movement and a mantra. So like for the soul seed, for example, I put my hands on my belly button, mm. I move them around a little bit and I just say, I am here, I am now, I matter. Mm -hmm. I am worthy of feeding my needs. I am designed to grow and thrive. I need, I need, I need, I need. And I talk about what I need. I just say out loud what I need. And there's seven of those mantras and movements. And I can do that in as little as 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it just drops me in. Mm -hmm. And everything gets clear. Mm -hmm. So I do that every day. Um, but the cool thing about that too is you can use it as a we. So in a family, like mm -hmm. we are here. We are now, we matter. Yeah. We are designed to grow and thrive. We need this. We need, we need. Yeah. And there's a lot of clarity that comes from that. So those are two of my ways. Also, I have like a non-negotiable yoga class that I don't miss. Yeah. <laughs> three, yeah. times, three times a week. So. Do you, um, yeah. um do the seven, I'm just, I'm just curious. Do the seven practices relate to the seven chakras? They don't exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious if it was like your version of that and how, or how you had. Felt. No, it's kind of funny that it ended up being seven. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, or synchronicity right. or it's, right. you've done this many lifetimes or like right. all of the things. That, all the things. All the yeah. things. Yeah. You know, the first one is the umbilicus. Yeah. And there's a whole, like, if you want, I could kind of go through the, the yeah, cycle. Do it. Yeah, the sure. Fun. Let's do it. Okay. So the first blueprint is your, is worthiness. And the body part is your umbilicus. And the archetype is the soul seed. So if you want, you're listening, you can put your hands on your belly button, just, mm -hmm. or you don't have to. Um, but the idea here is this is the place where we were first connected to our humanness. Mm -hmm. This is the place where we grew and gestated and from which we received everything we needed. Mm -hmm. There was this channel that fed us effortlessly without us even having to ask, we were worthy. Mm -hmm. Worthiness is the blueprint here. Mm -hmm. It's our most core essential way of being as a human is worthy, which is so wild because as I do the work of developmental and sexual reclamation for people, worthiness is always the biggest challenge that people don't think they have. And we don't think we have it because it's the most non-cognitive of the blueprints. This is the most embodied this mm -hmm. is a baby state. Yeah. But then when you're born and your umbilical cord is cut, what happens? You effortlessly know how to cry for what you need. Mm -hmm. so you, you feel your needs and you cry for them. And in an ideal situation, your needs are met and tended to by others. And so you learn you're worthy of having your needs met. Of course, that doesn't always happen or it happens to varying levels based on our needs. And at a very young, non-cognitive age, we start to develop a relationship to our needs mm -hmm. and if we're worthy of them or not. And we develop all kinds of responses to whatever happens around us. Mm -hmm. But if we can reconnect to, I am here, I am now, I matter, I'm worthy of feeding mm -hmm. my needs. I am designed to grow and thrive. Mm -hmm. I need, I need, I need. Then in some ways it doesn't matter what happens. Yeah. Because we can... We can do this now. So once we know that we have what we need, our seed has been planted in the ground, we start to sprout. We're, we're getting what we need. And what do we need next? There's a little teeny sprout of a flower. We need protection. We need that cage mm, of protection. Yeah. yeah. And we need someone also who's continuously giving us what we need and also keeping out what we don't need. Mm -hmm. And so this is where the archetype of the gatekeeper comes in and it's associated with the hip. Mm. And this is the part of you that says, I get to decide what comes in and what stays out. And when we're young, hopefully our parents are doing that for us. They're saying, that's not healthy. It doesn't get to come in. Or this is healthy and we're going to give you a lot of it. Unfortunately, a lot of times, like our parents ended up being the unhealthy thing. And so crap, now what happens? Mm -hmm. Well, we become either hyper self-sufficient or hyper vigilant, or we, ha we have collapsed sense of boundaries and we overgive. So this is the place where we say, I get to decide what comes in and what stays out. I keep my temple healthy, happy, and holy. Mm -hmm. I feed my seed what it needs. 
I say yes to this and yes to this and yes to this and no to this and no to this and no to this. Mm -hmm. It's the medicine of sovereignty. So those two blueprints alone, I mean, I spend most of my time with people on those two. I bet. Yeah, I bet. But the cool thing is, as you have more sovereignty, you move more up into your heart. Yeah. And into your breasts and into your chest. And you start to say, I feel my, my feelings fully. I can share them. Yeah. I'm medicine. Like you start to feel the medicine of your flower in bloom. And it's sort of this teenage self that's like, hey, look at me. And you feel safe in your sensuality and your sexuality. Mm -hmm. because you're always protecting your babies because you're always watching for your your basic needs mm -hmm. then from there the sage develops in the third eye mm -hmm. which is clarity and choice leadership it's the wiser older bloom who's been here before mm -hmm. <laughs> who knows what happens if i let someone mm -hmm. manipulate me or control me the heart space can't be shamed or repressed mm -hmm. the mind it's about manipulation and control, so clarity and choice. And then from there, we do like an awakening with hands and feet on the whole body. This is sort of where that shaking mm -hmm. and that patting down our body comes in. This is vitality mm -hmm. and power and safety. Mm -hmm. the sense that we can weed and water. We can move things where they need to be. We can keep things fresh mm -hmm. and vital. And then the sixth blueprint is the pollinator. So once you've got this healthy garden, mm. it's got wisdom, it's got expression and medicine, safety, sovereignty, you're feeding the baby, you're weeding and watering, you're keeping unhealthy things out, then the bees come because you've got this healthy garden. What are the bees? They're sex with nature. Mm -hmm. it's biodiversity, it's the sensuality, it's the mixing and mingling. So there's something to help awaken that. And it's a sense of feeling like all of you belong. Mm -hmm. like there's actually a regenerative relationship with your aliveness and the sweetness and nectar of life. The bees also carry lineage, song, and dance throughout time. And then finally, we need a gardener, and this is the crown. So the sacred gardener puts its arms up to the sky and says, use me, move me, make me an instrument. I'm willing, I'm surrendered, I'm listening. So those are like, I didn't exactly yeah, I love it. That's the cycle. It's so, it reminds obviously, or maybe not obviously to you, but if you've been teaching yoga for a long time, it reminds me of the intention behind the chakras mm -hmm. with a feminine touch. Yeah. With this feminine feel and language that's um, less about achieving something and more about feeling it. And I think that there's been a real masculine influence on Western yoga. Um, but when, with this little touch, it's so beautiful how um, inviting it is and healthy and vital. Again, just kind of the language that you were, you, you were using and the visual, I can just kind of float away <laughs> into this right. garden and feel it evolving in a way that feels a little bit more mystical and a little bit more um, juicy than the sort of traditional way that I've thought about energy channels, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, it's something yeah. is growing in you. It's like, yeah. you are this juicy yeah. thing. You're a yeah. flower that's meant yeah. to grow and thrive. Yeah. And so you can start to really feel that, like, can I sink my roots into this soil? Yeah. And, and also that's another piece of it is that we have our collective soil. Yeah. And yeah. So some of us are going to have a harder time with this because we're planted in a certain place with a certain color of skin or whatever. Yeah. Um, so this, as a mom, leads me to ask, did you grow up like this? Did you grow up having this conversation? Is this, did oh, no. you have passed down? <laughs> Was this your mom? Was this your dad? No um, one. Do they like roll their eyes at you now? Like, tell me about real life. That's so beautiful, everything you just painted. I love it, I love it, and want to float away into fairyland. But on this earth, how did people, yeah. where did this come from and how are they reacting to it? <laughs> well, it's so, I love that you asked that. And the other thing that's funny about the fairyland, it's like, this came out of me working with hundreds of people with yeah. really intense trauma. And the thing is, yeah, is everything. And so in the world of trauma, I'm going to answer your question in a second, but yeah, yeah. in the world of trauma, there's this momentum of dysregulation and disease, essentially. Mm -hmm. And 
whatever momentum is stronger, the momentum of dysregulation or the momentum of regulation wins. And so I've had to discover, I've had to be able to anchor into something so fucking healthy Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. I wouldn't get pummeled out by tons of dysregulation always coming to me. Yeah. And this is that. This is that. And it doesn't bypass the dysregulation, but it works with it. It says, okay, cool. This is the thing, manipulation and control. We need clarity and choice. And here's the life cycle to get there. You got to first do one, two, three, probably. So anyway, um, I grew up in a family of teachers. (laughs) So (laughs) that part is my lineage, right? My mom and my dad, my brother, everyone in my family's teachers. Um, My dad was also a basketball coach. So I really learned how to he was a coach, I'm a coach, but I really learned how to break things down into the fundamentals Mm -hmm. from my parents and communicate those things to people. But I would say they're fairly conventional. Mm -hmm. I was raised Jewish. My mom was Jewish. Mm -hmm. My dad, my dad's side of the family is Christian, but not really religious. Mm -hmm. So I was raised Jewish, but a lot of people who were raised Jewish have the same experience where it's kind of cultural and historic, but not actually spiritual. Mm -hmm. Um, Which is a shame because there's such incredibly rich we have so much. So much. I've been like obsessed with Judaism the last same, two years. Same. Same. <laughs> like I, I have Shabbat home. Home. Say, I light candles in my yoga classes and do the Shabbat prayers. And I, people, Shabbat. And I stopped, stopped saying Om and started saying Shalom. I was like, that's me. Yeah. I'm not Hindu. Amazing. I'm Jewish. Yeah. I just Fuck turned yeah. away from it because I felt more comfortable. But this has been part of our lineage forever. Yeah. New moons, we've been doing that as, as Jewish practitioners. It just got lost. Yeah. But totally. it's coming and, back. And a lot got lost in Judaism because yeah. of yeah. all of the yeah. trauma. Yeah. Right? And that's something that yeah. we don't even want to acknowledge because we hyper responded to that by becoming hyper successful and hyper vigilant yeah. and hyper this and hyper that. So right. like, oh no, we're fine. We're successful. Right. We're good. Right. It's right. like, actually, there are so many Jewish people who are completely disembodied, completely yeah. repressed, like, you know, and that's everywhere, yes. but there's yeah. a lot of this interesting disembodiment also in the Jewish yeah. culture now. Yes. But anyway, so yeah, I was raised Jewish, but my parents are really, I mean, they fought a lot. There was a lot of like, meh, not great relational dynamics in my home growing up, um, like pretty, pretty mm-hmm. bad. And they always thought I was like too sensitive, too deep, too emotional. So it wasn't like, I didn't get any guidance or support in this way of being. But when I was like 16 or 17, I had found this woman who was a blogger and I like flocked to her. And I was like, you're like the 15 year old older version of me. She was like 12 or 15 years older. I was like, can you be my old lady friend? And she was my mentor for about 10 years Mm -hmm. and really helped me decondition from convention and how I'm supposed to be and all of that and initiated me back into the ways of spirit and mysticism and magic and earth and all of that. So that was a real profound blessing in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, when I wrote Secret Bad Girl, my family didn't talk to me for like six months. It was not easy. It was not like a, this has not been an easy path. Yeah. They didn't talk. Did you write about them in it? Is that why? Or was it they didn't want to hear the stories or what was, what do you think? I mean, I didn't write a ton about them, but I mentioned you know, little bits, like about as much as I had just mentioned here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mostly they had a lot of shame because I was... When I was 13, I lost my virginity to statutory anal rape. And that was a pretty horrible thing. And I told my mom, like, and she didn't do anything. I told her multiple times, and I think she just dissociated from it. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned that in the book. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. It was just like probably just about the worst thing, like her shame and her grief about that. Yeah. But, But we've come through a lot. I would say my parents, while they had a pretty dysfunctional relationship, are fairly healthy people. Like they're securely attached, they're functional. Mm-hmm. Nobody has like a mental illness or anything like that. Mm-hmm. My dad's probably a little bit of an alcoholic, but you know. <laughs> Who isn't these days? <laughs> so, anyway, all of that to say, now, after having, I think after the Me Too movement happened, because mm-hmm. I, I wrote Secret Bad Girl. It published a year and a half before. Mm-hmm. It was a while, wasn't it a while ago? Because I feel like I I learned about you from Angela Loria. Because I remember when I did 
yeah, she was a, like your book had just come out or she had it in her hands and she was obsessed with you and obsessed with the book and obsessed with the work and everywhere we'd go, she'd be like, Rachel's the best and Rachel's the best. And, and I love Angela. I so, saw her recently. She was in San Diego. <laughs> she and I, so, it's like funny. We have a great little relationship. Yeah. Um, but so January that was, was that three years ago? It was yeah. January, 2016. Yeah. So, and then the Me Too movement happened, I think, March 2017. Okay. Yeah. So it was about a year and a half later. So I was ahead of that curve in a yeah. big way. And, um, but once that happened, my parents started to look at me differently. Like, wow, mm. you're not the black sheep, like asshole who like, mm. t- you know, whatever, told all your secrets. You're this wise girl who was ahead of her time and you're helping so many people. And all of a sudden there was a place for me that made yeah. sense. Yeah. which I'm really grateful for. And now my, my mom, I have a feeling that like my mom will end up coming under my wing eventually, but who knows? <laughs> and so when you do some of the work from this mentor, did it feel like coming home? Like you'd done this before and it felt powerful yet not the norm. Yeah. You know, it felt both, like it rang true in some part of me and also another part of me was really resistant. So maybe there was a physiological part of me that was like, yeah, this is, this is who I am. This is what I'm meant to be doing. And then a mental part of me that was really concerned with like, well, how is this going to work or how are we going to actually get there? I want to talk about that fear piece. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I see this now with my clients a ton where they'll, where they'll have that. So I'm glad that you asked. I'm like, oh yeah. I used to be one afraid of looking foolish. Mm-hmm. I thought anything spiritual was foolish. I didn't believe mm-hmm. in God. I didn't know what God was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I Same. remember totally breaking down to my mentor being like, I don't know what God is. I think I need God. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> and her being like, yeah, you do. And being like, <laughs> Um, and then of course I was in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, which is a Lakota reservation mm-hmm. and like got spiritually initiated by all these Lakota men. They were like, you are a spiritual leader. And I was like, I don't even know what God is. How am I a spiritual leader? I think it was so weird. Yeah. I just think the fear is real. Even when you're brave, even when you're writing your story, even when you're out helping other people with their trauma um, as because of your resolution, you know, all of the pieces of it is that there's, there is fear at different stages along the way. Cause I think people totally. look at truth tellers and people who can write books about this and speak openly about the things that have happened. I'm very open about my past. And I, I talk a lot about, um, a variety of things that, that happened that were not awesome and were super hard mm-hmm. and were scary. And Yet it, and that's, and sort of like holding that with the courage and holding that with the like, oh, this is, this is that light in the dark in real time. And I think sometimes in modern, especially right now with social media, people just have this image in this world that look, I'm just out there speaking my truth. And it looks so bold and brave and courageous. And meanwhile, like behind the scenes are like chewing their nails or there's always that both, you know? Yeah, totally. I'm afraid all the time. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm afraid all the time, but yeah. like, there's things right now in my life that I'm like, okay, how do I deal with this? Like yeah. relational things yeah. or even with this book, I was going to self-publish it. And now I've been getting a lot of actually Angela and a few other book people are like, you need a publisher. Yeah. And I've been like, ah, publisher, like a real, lots of press. Ah. Like it's so scary yeah. still. Now I'm getting more used to it, but it's literally taken me about six months to be like, yeah. okay, I'll get a publisher. <laughs> like, Rrr. Yeah. And we're, and I think just kind of being aware of it and working through it and deciding when like now is like the timing is not always right. Yeah. You know, and that's okay too. Because of vulnerability and authenticity and me too and trauma and healing being so in our face right now, I have a lot of uh, women in our community who want this to happen fast is my point. They're talking mm-hmm. about, well, I just need to speak my truth fast. And if I tell everybody the story, then I'll be through it. And there's this sort of <laughs> speed and like pace at which life is happening that yeah. we're trying to do that also with this deeper spirit work. And I'm always just pulling back. Like, let's just relax. 
Right. And not to asleep, but relax, like let it digest. In Ayurveda, we always say digest the emotions, right? Like digest our life. Yeah. Well, an emergency moves fast and contagious. The speed of trauma is fast and contagious. And so part of what happens oftentimes when we move into this territory is we feel the emergency that's stored in our bodies. That's what trauma is. It's the stored emergency response. Mm -hmm. And we want to embody that. So we want to very quickly get the hell out of here. Yeah. Yeah. That's really normal. Yeah. Or we're so kind of collapsed that we're like, well, I'm here, but am I ever going to get out of here? I don't want to go here. I'll collapse even more. So we either go into that hyper arousal or the hypo collapse state. So it's really normal for that to happen. And I think as practitioners, part of our job is one, normalizing, like it makes sense that you want to go really fast. This Mm -hmm. is scary Mm -hmm. when you're talking about going into scary places. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. there's a lot of layers here. And so what's the most doable bit for you? Mm -hmm. Instead of rushing through to the end, Mm -hmm. this is about a process of doably coming into more vitality. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily about excavating some big dark secret and like getting it out. It is, that is part of it. But the more you are devoted to your vitality, the more capacity you're going to have to do that deep excavation. So let's start there. How about we start there? (laughs) And devotion to vitality can be, you know, as simple as, again, committing to nature, like a nature practice or sleep (laughs) or water, you know, basic. I sleep so much. Again. Do you have small children? No. Right. No. This is my, this is, I'm just saying, I learn I all my good tricks from my bad, from my friends who don't have children. They, I learn oh, so I much. I do too. I do as well. I'm a big sleep advocate, so I'm just messing with you, but right. I love, I no, always I am like, yes, you are the wise ones. Now tell me how to do it with children. Yeah, no, I don't know. No, I think about that all the time. I'm like, how will I ever? Yeah. And you will, because that's what we've done for all of time is yeah, women for so. all of time. And that was also the switch. This is, this was mm. such a powerful time when my babies were babies. Somehow I got the, the hit or the download that women for all of time, I'm sure I read it in a book and then embodied it. Women for all of time have been up in the middle of the night with their babies. Mm. So I remember rocking and nursing and just mm. being like heart connect to all the other women who are awake right now. And it, <laughs> shifted the entire way of being up in the night. I was like, this was going to pass. This is a moment in time that this is a rite of motherhood. Like this is a rite of passage. This is what we do. This is how we get our mama wings. Like this is how we get strong. And it just shifted how I was feeling because I was very sad about losing sleep and angry, mostly angry, not sad. <laughs> it was mostly like, I'm so damn tired. Go to sleep, you little brat. I mean, I would get angry and yell things that are not mm. kind at all that I didn't really feel, but I was just so tired. I had to yeah. find another way to yeah. approach this situation that I felt so out of control over. Yeah. And I just use that as an example of connection to spirit and source and ritual and lineage and tradition of the role is so powerful. That is so powerful. That's in so in powerful. sort of any situation, you yeah. know, when you're like, oh, this is like women rising up for this or this or this, or to connect at a larger level for what we've always done has really helped build strength. Actually, I want to talk about that in terms of sexual, what do you call it? Sexual proclamation? No. Oh, reclamation? Reclamation. I couldn't read my own notes. <laughs> what is that? And how do we do that? <laughs> what yeah. that? See, I'm, I'm like, do it quick. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so for me, part of the reason why, so a lot of people come to me, they're like, I want sexual reclamation. I'm like, cool, <laughs> let's do all this other shit. Oh. Then, <laughs> then the sexual reclamation is pretty like simple. You've got the fundamental foundational tools to honor yourself, feel that you're worthy, say yes and say no, express yourself fully, like align to your truth. Those things in the bedroom make awesome sex, make awesome loverships, make awesome sexual partnerships, even Mm long-term. That's the heart of intimacy is I am honoring myself fully and 
leaning into our shared space and asking you if you can do that too. And I'm offering my honor to you as well, based on your truth. So sex is a negotiation of pleasure. It's a negotiation of power and it's vulnerable and it's intimate. And to really have a fulfilling sexual life requires that, I think, self-knowing and that self-caring Mm-hmm. that you can then also offer to another person. So for me, sexual reclamation is about trusting that you're worth a vulnerable, intimate experience, which sometimes is super pleasurable and super orgasmic and sometimes is super vulnerable and emotional and sometimes is super healing or cathartic and sometimes is super like, ugh, we're in this spot right now. And for all of that to be okay, for all of that to be allowed. Mm-hmm. Do you have to do that? Do you think you have to, that has to be in a partnership or can someone who's not in partnership or alone feel that or start to feel it with themselves? Yeah. Like talk a little bit about that. Yeah, totally. I, you don't have to do this in partnership. Mm-hmm. Um, you can definitely do that by yourself, right? So it's like, one of the practices that I've had previously or whatever, sometimes I pick it back up is just this, like, I love you. So mm-hmm. I say to myself, I love you. So, mm-hmm. and I let my hands do what love would do. Mm-hmm. So dot, 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 mm-hmm. you know, so I'm going to like lather mm-hmm. myself in lotion or so I'm going to just keep my hands on my heart right now. Mm-hmm. Or so I'm going to, and really starting to get curious about, well, what would love do Mm-hmm. for me in this moment mm-hmm. that can be so vulnerable mm-hmm. that can be so tender you might be sitting there like I don't fucking know mm-hmm. yeah. what my hands would do yeah right or you could be like I love you so and you realize that you're really sad mm-hmm. or you realize that you're really like you have an emotion you don't want to be with mm-hmm. what do you do then mm-hmm. what would love do then mm-hmm. so that's one more a little bit of an emotional piece mm-hmm. of things I don't teach this, but like I've done things with Jade Egg where, you know, I'm awakening my, my own sexual energy. Mm-hmm. And in, in that as well, the same, pra- same thing will happen mm-hmm. where it's not just about your sexual energy and cool. Now I'm so super sexual and awake and juicy. It's like, oh shit. Now I'm feeling all the ways that I'm blocked up, that I'm stopped up, that I'm repressive, yeah. that I'm afraid of myself. And all of that is also what you bring into sex with another person. Yeah. And those are two more, like one of those was emotional, one was energetic. And then there's also kink, right? Like how do I, what's the role that I want to play that feels both safe and sexy for me? Mm -hmm. And so you can do that with yourself. Like what's the role that I want to play with myself right now that feels safe and sexy? Mm -hmm. I might want to just like, be playful. I might want to put on something cute and dance around and that can be a sexual reclamation. Like I'm going to be afraid if that feels a rock my channel or with another person, what would feel safe yeah. and sexy with them? Maybe it's that I really want to be like taken care of. Yeah. I think it's so just fascinating in, um, so Ayurveda has a daily practice of self, of Abhyanga, which is self-massage. Mm. And when I started doing it daily, and I, listen, I had read about it for years and rolled yeah. my eyes and turned the page. Like I was like, right, uh-huh. Like anyone, and I would say, and like anyone's got time for that, you know, sort of the story of like, who. And eventually, over many years, I finally decided, like, well, let me try it. <laughs> so, like, I'm so, like, I don't have time for that. But what would it feel like? What a profound shift mm-hmm. in how I take care of myself. Mm-hmm. And I don't talk about it very much. I just, just not on purpose, just it hasn't come out very much. That I think that that devotion to that specific practice that I learned from this wisdom, right? I didn't like decide one day. I just kind of opened up that, well, maybe there's something here. Um, Led me to this just incredible awakening of deep self-care at a physical level that Mm -hmm. I had never experienced before because Mm -hmm. of the sacredness of touch and exploration that Abhyanga asks you to do every day. 
And so through the seasons, through my monthly cycle, like being able to watch things swell and ebb and flow and expand and contract and how things like how my muscles feel after I've been lifting a lot of weights. I do a lot of weightlifting now and super fun, but then I'll be like, whoa, that feels this way. You know, just noticing Mm -hmm. my body. And as someone who experienced uh, layers of variety of physical and emotional mental traumas um, Mm -hmm. in childhood, Mm-hmm. As much as I had worked through it on the yoga mat, in therapy, in all the ways with a shaman, you know, done all the things <laughs> that the actual art of self massage daily was mm-hmm. such a peaceful way to come home to my body, especially mm-hmm. as I was moving closer to 40, because that was a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it really, it really was such a simple practice that made such a profound difference. Mm. And that safe and sexy and the power and pleasure that you said, um, it's sort of how I began to feel like in that embrace of all of that duality be emerged into, Oh, this is, this is wholeness. Right. I don't have to be afraid of one or the other. It's really an embodiment of power that is it's, it's gentle too, you know? Oh, it's so cool that, that, that it sort of came together with what you said. And I think I'm also really curious about how you see anger in terms of reclaiming, in terms of expression. Mm. How do you work with it? How do you talk about it in terms of um, moving that out of the body or experiencing it moment to moment? Yeah. Anger is the fire mm-hmm. of protection when less fiery means didn't work. Mm -hmm. Anger is the fire that protects our pleasure, our innocence, our whatever. And oftentimes anger is what emerges when, like I said, your maybe calmer or more Mm. gentle no wasn't heard. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it's just an unheard no. Or an unspoken. Unheard or unspoken no. Right, yeah. Or an un, a chronically unmet need. Yeah. Yeah. Because so many women keep it inside and then all of a sudden, I mean, I hear this all the time and I see it in motherhood all the time is the sort of, Gee, like everything's fine, it's okay. And then all of a sudden this rage mm-hmm. because of that unspoken no, because of not aligning with those sort of boundaries because of people pleasing, right? There's so many layers of this. There's so many layers. And what I will say is that, you know, I wanted to say this at some point throughout the conversation as well, but sometimes, right? So our first emergency response is hyper-socialization. So if we sense that somebody is not safe for any number of reasons, maybe they express a lot of anger about other people all the time, or maybe they are a little bit you know, on some kind of spectrum of mental health and it expresses Mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't feel safe. Or maybe they're bigger than us or maybe they have all the money in the household. There's a lot of ways in which we might then feel unsafe Mm -hmm. to speak our truth. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard. And sometimes if we are living with somebody who's mentally or emotionally unwell, or if we grew up in that kind of environment, we don't have the move. We we don't feel safe. We literally don't feel safe saying something simple like, hey, that bothers me when you do that. Can you, can you not next time? Because what's the risk? What will happen if I say that to this person? Will they dismiss me? Will they gaslight me? Will they tell me I'm stupid? Will they get angry at me? Will something bad happen if I speak my truth? So I just want to destigmatize this a little bit because a lot of us have grown up in environments where other people were not open to feedback. Yeah. And still aren't. So thank and you. Still aren't. Yeah. <laughs> so we can blame Thanks. ourselves yeah. for all the ways that we didn't get to say no and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But like, actually that's your system protecting you Yeah. and that's okay. Yeah. And one of the things that I say to people who've been in those kinds of situations or who still are, it's like, do you have people that you know you can give feedback to, that you know you can speak your truth with, that you know you can say no or say this thing bothered me and feel safe? What are the qualities about those people? 
And wouldn't it be amazing if your life was full of those people? Because mm-hmm. you deserve that. Mm-hmm. You deserve to be surrounded by people who are open to feedback. Mm-hmm. You deserve to be around people who are safe. Mm-hmm. Even if your life gets smaller. Yeah. Right. And I do think that the more we have relationships with people who are healthier, the more we're able to spot mm-hmm. disrelation or spot when something is a little bit toxic and be like, let me not let that in. Because getting out of a situation that's toxic is much harder than not getting into it. Mm-hmm. Right? Getting, getting someone to leave or leaving a toxic dynamic Mm -hmm. is often a lot harder. Yeah. And that's okay if you're in that spot and you're listening to this and you're like, fuck, that's me. Yeah, yeah. You know, you'll know when the time is right how to do that. I want to clarify too, because what I'm thinking of is I I said, and your life gets smaller, and that's actually not true. Right. Because I think in, in many ways your life expands. It actually gets like there's like this vibration that opens when you're connected to nature and earth and other soul friends and people who get you and can get feedback and have this kind of deep, right? Like depth totally. of conversation. But some of the relationships that may be in your orbit may dissolve. Yeah. So for a while, maybe the social calendar may look smaller or some aspects of old you or old, not old you, but you know what I mean? It's like, so, we're, yeah. we're afraid of losing those relationships, but then the world is sort of open to us. So yeah, and so as you're talking, it's beautiful. Like the flower imagery is here. So you yeah. are the flower, and there are a ton of fucking weeds that are yeah. taking up a lot of space, and that yeah. look maybe like they are giving the facade of a vibrant life, <laughs> yeah. but it's actually weeds. Yeah. And your bloom is smaller, and so. Yeah yeah, weeding things isn't easy. I mean, whoever's had a garden knows, like, yeah, yeah. weed all these motherfuckers exactly. weeds all the time, <laughs> right? Like, gosh, they're just nonstop. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. It's a nonstop process of weeding and watering yeah. to keep yourself yeah. vibrant yeah. and to keep your flower in full bloom. Yeah. So it's the same way that you're saying yeah. something, some things are going to go, but yeah. medicine yeah. of your flower expands. Yeah. yeah. Totally. And it didn't occur to me until we were just talking about this in this way, but also the, um, I quit drinking over the summer and mm-hmm. people always ask me like, how hard, isn't it so hard? And it's a we- it was just a weed. And so once it was gone, mm-hmm. it's actually not that hard. Sometimes in social situations, I will say it's hard just because it's an easier conversation than going down. Like, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad that it's really not that hard and it's been magical <laughs> and wonderful. Okay. And so sometimes I don't, I don't know. It, it's just, that's the choice I make. But um, because of the growing, because of the vitality, because the, the way that you feel, the way that I feel, I don't, I'm not like making the choice to not ever not feel that way. And that was one thing that was starting to just be a weed where it was like, oh, if I had too much wine, the next day I didn't wake up early feeling awesome. I felt like I had a headache and I felt a little cloudy and I don't like feeling that way. So it wasn't a big deal. Um, but it was a profound weed that continued to lead to that growth and vitality. And that's also, I think, a lot of women in our life do drink a lot. And so I do want to encourage people to look at it as a weed and not as a super hard thing that's going to change your whole life. Like, I don't know, try it and see how it feels. It may just feel really different and not be a big, it's so hard and now I'm going to AA, like all of these things. Like, that's not my truth and that's not my my experience. And so that's why I, I just want to say like, there might be other things, right? Like toxic Netflix or something. I don't know. I love Netflix, so I'm not blaming it, but I'm saying sometimes it's other things and weeds can be people and also ways that we live habits. Yeah. Right. Totally. I love yeah. that. And I love, I love the alcohol metaphor, right. Of weeding and watering, like I'm yeah. going to pour water here instead. I'm going to hydrate my soil. Totally. I learned this. You'll be interested in this. I don't think I've shared this. I learned the history of the word spirits. I mean, Mm. of course, Mm. but we call them spirits because they used to fill you with the dark spirits. Mm. Like once I saw that crossover, I was like, no, what? Like, oh, boom, of course, that's what it's called. And that's what that darkness and sort of murkiness, like my best, um, my, my worst behavior 
mostly happen when I was full of spirits. <laughs> that's spirit. Yeah, yeah totally. That's, that's so true. And I want to say something else too about this, the weeding and the watering piece, like yeah. the spirits piece. I live a predominantly sober lifestyle. It's yeah. not because I never had, I went through period, like little bits of time here and there where I would smoke too much pot or something, but like, yeah. I've not, I don't really have an addictive personality. Yeah. However, um, I've just, the more I've watered my health, mm -hmm. the less inclined I am to let weeds grow. Mm -hmm. So it can happen the other way around as well, where you can just start saying, look, like, like if anybody's ever done a 30 day yoga practice mm -hmm. or something where they have to devote to health for 30 days, it becomes very apparent everything that's unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this, this much coffee hurts my stomach, but I never totally. noticed it until I, yeah got healthier. So you can go the other way first as well. Mm -hmm. And just allow yourself to find that middle pendulum. I still mm -hmm. drink occasionally or smoke occasionally, but it's not mm -hmm. a, like a part of my life mm -hmm. that's common. It's just sort of like, okay, you know, every now and then this or that mm -hmm. comes in. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. I think that middle path, those Buddhists were onto something with the middle path. <laughs> um, what do you, okay. Last question. Cause I want to honor your time too. Sure. Um, what is, what does hyper self-sufficient look like? I've heard you say it a few times and I love that phrase. So what does that look like? Yeah. So one of the things that happens with each of these wounds that we've got, mm -hmm. um, there's a hyper and a hypo response. Mm -hmm. So the, the wound of neglect, somebody didn't care for you. Mm -hmm. The hypo response would be, well, no one cared about me, so I must not matter. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. An inability to kind of to care for ourselves. Um, the hyper response to no one takes care of me could look like one of two things. A hyper self-reliance no one's going to take care of me. So I'm going to do all of the caring for myself and everyone else around me because clearly everyone needs to be cared for because no one's caring for anybody. Right. Mm -hmm. Or it could be a little bit of deviance. The people who were supposed to take care of me didn't. So I'm going to let this bad thing take care of me. These spirits, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this food, this mm -hmm. Netflix, this affair, this affair takes care of me. So we, with every wound, there's a hyper and a hypo way that we try to stay safe, mm -hmm. that we try to get our need met. Mm -hmm. We're trying in a way that's dysfunctional and dysregulated, but we're trying to get our need met. So that's the beautiful part. Hyper self-sufficiency just wants to be cared for mm -hmm. and doesn't trust that other people can. Mm -hmm. And so once you start doing that for yourself, that pattern dissolves ish. Well, with hyper self-sufficiency, the no, because <laughs> you're going to always keep taking care of yourself because you don't think anyone else can. So yeah. the practice is around both feeding your needs, but also the vulnerability of asking, Yeah, can, can you, like, oh, you, yeah. are you able to meet me in this place mm -hmm. and making really clear requests that are vulnerable? Mm-hmm. Um, I can't wait for the book. I'm super excited. <laughs> whenever it blooms, whenever it lands, we'll it's be organic. <laughs> I'm it's organic. And whenever it does you get out of the way. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's what I would say. Whenever I get out of the way, this will happen. <laughs> yeah. I've <laughs> truly tried to control the timeline. Like, and I'm just at this point, like, I really can't do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So to close, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for yeah, thank taking you. your time. Thank you for educating us. Thank you for the work that you do. I think it's so yeah. super duper important. Um, I say it like positively, like super duper, cause that's my nature, but I mean it at a very deep level. Like it's very important and I really appreciate it. Um, mm -hmm. what do you want to say to the women listening who are feeling Mm, uncomfortable or emotional or excited perhaps that there's, you know, they learn something. Mm -hmm. So how do you want to say goodbye to them? I would just say that so often when we're thinking about what isn't working or what we want, we're, we look for like a 10 step program to get <laughs> from here to there. 
and we really get fixated on like, well, what's the best thing to do? What's mm-hmm. the first thing? Like, what do I have to do? Like, what's, my, mm-hmm. what's my action plan here? Mm-hmm. And I just want to encourage you to tune in perhaps and ask yourself, like, did anything from this conversation rouse a sense of curiosity in me? Mm-hmm. Was mm-hmm. I curious about doing daily massage? Was mm-hmm. I curious about um, prioritizing mm-hmm. devotion to myself as mm-hmm. the key to boundaries? Mm-hmm. Did this, this piece around weeding things really mm-hmm. piqued my curiosity? What roused something in me? What stirred mm-hmm. me? Mm-hmm. And follow what stirs you, follow your curiosity, because that's your personal inherent wisdom and natural treatment plan that knows what to do. Mm-hmm. Like you have everything you need in your physiology. You are a self-correcting mm-hmm. mechanism. Mm-hmm. So follow that impulse, mm-hmm. if you can, in a way that feels doable and not overwhelming. Mm-hmm. That's what I would say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was nice yeah. to have a conversation and officially meet. Now we have so much in common that you better <laughs> get in touch with me when you come to DC. That's mom, oh, totally mama will. bear I totally orders. I we'll, totally go, we'll go to Southeast and walk around. You won't even recognize it oh, in terms yeah. of there's just a lot of um, little cute businesses and yeah. interesting things happening. So we'll yeah. go to That's the old awesome. stomping grounds. <laughs> I would love that. Thank Yay. you so much. Bye. Have a great weekend. Okay.